My name is Dr. Rosanna Salvatera, and I'm the Medical Officer of Health. I happen to be the Medical Officer of Health for a board of health that has endorsed the basic income uh, back in June. Uh, and I also chair the Peterborough Food Action Network, uh, and uh, we are a member of Nourish. So I'm wearing many hats this evening, and I have the honor of, in, of introducing <coughs> our, uh, our esteemed guest and speaker. Uh, but before I do, I just want to remind us that food is central to our lives. I hope most of you had a nice meal before you came. If you didn't, we do have food out in the back for you. Uh, but it, it's a powerful ingredient for bringing people together. Uh, and as a result, it often it, it offers a unique starting point for creating new relationships and stories. Uh, so when it comes to our present day relationship with food, however, there are many stories that are disregarded or ignored. Uh, and the Nourish Food series is uh, meant to bring together thought leaders in their respective fields to help us think broader social, economic, environmental, and cultural issues connected to food. Uh, by tapping into stories that are rarely told, the series helps us unpack what we have taken for granted and helps us to reassess our relationship to food and its impact on, on us at an individual, community, and at global levels. Now, uh, the basic income guarantee certainly is a story that we've heard a lot about in the media uh, lately. Uh, but last October, uh, we launched, the uh, series was launched with our guest speaker, Dr. Valerie Teresuk, and I think some of you were there that evening. Uh, and she shared with us the, uh, the findings from her work on uh, the costs of food insecurity. Today we welcome another international speaker, Dr. Evelyn Forget. Evelyn Forget is an economist, a professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba, and academic director of the Manitoba Research Data Center. She is an adjunct scientist with the Manitoba Center for Health Policy and a research associate with the Manitoba First Nations Center for Aboriginal Health. She has consulted for provincial and federal government departments, First Nations and NGOs. Her current research focuses on the health and social consequences of anti-poverty interventions and the cost-effectiveness of health care interventions. Currently, Dr. Forget is the first Kieran Janigan visiting scholar at Massey College, where she is taking the lead on investigations into the results and trends that arose from the mid-1970s Mincom Guaranteed Annual Income Experiment in Dauphin, Manitoba. While announcing this new scholarship, Hugh Siegel, master of Massey College, praised Dr. Forget for being a leading, courageous, and entrepreneurial scholar. <clears throat> so Manitoba's loss is Ontario's gain, these many months that Dr. Forget is uh, spending her sojourn at Massey College. We are delighted that she and her husband, Richard, made the drive up to Peterborough today. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're hoping it snows very heavily, so maybe we'll keep her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she spent the afternoon with a very nice bunch of municipal politicians. We had a good turnout for that. And uh, we are very glad that she has uh, agreed to stay and speak with you this tonight. So uh, please help me in welcoming Dr. Evelyn Forge. For that lovely introduction. I feel a bit like a rock star up here with all this uh, energy, so if I break into a few dance moves, just bear with me. Um, what I want to do today, and, and I, I thank you so much for coming out to hear me, because it's a real treat a tip for an academic to be able to stand up and talk about a project that they've been working on for a long time. So it's really nice to have a captive audience here, and you're not even students, so you don't have to be. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about the Mincom Project. The Mincom Project was the very first attempt in a high-income country, and in fact it was in Canada, to try an experiment to see what happens if we give people a guaranteed annual income. Before I talk about the project proper, though, I think I would like to introduce just a few things that we probably already know. 
We know we don't do a very good job of dealing with poverty in this country. Um, a couple of years ago, UNICEF ranked us as number 17 overall in terms of the well-being of our kids. Um, number 15 out of 29 um, rich countries in terms of how well we do um, in terms of the material well-being of our kids. 13.3% of kids grows up poor. When we look at indigenous kids, we're talking about 40% of the total number of kids. When we look at northern households, 40% of northern households and 62% of the kids living in the north don't get enough to eat on a regular basis. 21% of single mothers in Canada lives in poverty. 13% of Canadian households struggle to put food on the table. I can read these forever. This is, this is appalling. It is appalling that we do such a terrible job dealing with poverty in such a rich country. When we add to that the changes that have taken place in the economy over the last couple of decades, the increase in, in uh, precarious employment, the difficulty people have in trying to attain a career and to build a decent middle class lifestyle in this country, I think it's not surprising perhaps that we're looking once again at the idea of a guaranteed annual income and asking if we can do a better job of delivering some of our social programs. Now, um, before I begin, there are a lot of different versions out there of what a guaranteed annual income is. So I want to tell you what it is that I'm talking about when I talk about a guaranteed annual income. A guaranteed annual income is a regular, reliable distribution of income to families sufficient to meet their basic needs. It's based on income, so it's not the same amount of money to everybody. It's a universal program, but it's based on how much income a family has. So a family with no income from any source would receive a fixed amount of money. As they get increased income from other sources, in particular from working, their benefits are reduced, but they're reduced less than proportionally. And the reason for that is an attempt to overcome the welfare wall a way of encouraging people who work by allowing them to keep some of their earnings, to keep more of their earnings than under existing programs. <clears throat> Most importantly, there are no behavioral conditions. You don't have to demonstrate job search, do what you want with your time, and do what you want with your money. It covers the working poor, as well as people on income assistance. A guaranteed annual income is not the same thing as income assistance, because it's an entitlement. People have a right. The only condition that's placed on receipt of it is how much money you have. Um, payments not tied to specific commodities. And families have the same rights to um, privacy that the rest of us take for granted <coughs> when we deal with the system. A guaranteed annual income is not the same thing as a living wage. Now, there are a lot of good reasons you might want to increase the minimum wage, but those are social justice reasons. Raising the minimum wage is not a particularly efficient way of dealing with poverty. Most poor people, um, most poor families have no one working at the minimum wage, and many people who do work for minimum wage are not from particularly poor families. So it's not an efficient way to address poverty. It's consistent with guaranteed annual income, but it's not a replacement for guaranteed annual income. And finally, I would like to say that a guaranteed annual income is not a replacement for all other social programs out there. So if you think of it in, in, in terms of Ontario, you might think of a guaranteed annual income as a replacement for Ontario Works and the Ontario Disability Support Payment. But everything else stays in place. You still have employment insurance, you still have the Canada Pension Plan, universal health coverage, and so on. Some of the programs we've got in this country actually operate as a guaranteed annual income already. For example, the National Child Benefit. Um, under the liberal plan, that's going to be enhanced somewhat, but uh, the National Child Benefit, in fact, is a guaranteed annual income for families with dependent kids. And one of the things we know from academic research on that is that it works very well. It improves the health of children, it improves the health of their parents, it increases, it improves educational outcomes. Similarly, if we look at the other end of the age distribution, um, people who are over 65 have access to the OAS and the Guaranteed Income Supplement. And that's another form of guaranteed annual income. And again, we know that, the, we know that OAS and GIS works. It improves the health, the mental and physical health of um, seniors.
what we lack in this country is um, is um, um, a reasonable approach to adult benefits. That is, the working age population between 18 and 65. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that poor kids have poor parents, poor families need better adult benefits. Now, what I want to talk about today is the income project, because it turns out that the only existing evidence for how a guaranteed annual income works in a high income country actually comes from this country. It comes from Canada. Now, the project I want to talk about was called MINCOM, and it was introduced in 1974 in the province of Manitoba. Um, it was a cost-shared program between the provincial government and the federal government. The federal government paid 75% of the costs, and the provincial government paid 25% of the costs. Because it was a government program, it was vulnerable to changes in government. Midway through income, the provincial government changed. So the NDP government fell and was replaced by a provincial progressive conservative government. No government's particularly keen on funding the special projects of its predecessors. Um, so they weren't, it lost political support provincially. Federally, the first Trudeau government was in power, but it was sort of hanging on by its fingernails throughout the 1970s. It was a minority government, and it was weakened. So the project continued until 1979. The families were paid, but the project ended in some disarray in 1979. <clears throat> there was no significant analysis done, and there was no database built. Now, MINCOM took place at a very particular time in our history. There were actually five of these guaranteed annual income experiments that took place in North America. Four of them were in the US, and one was in Canada. And um, it, it was taking place at a time when we were rethinking the way we were delivering all of our social programs. So in Canada, this was the same period of time that we introduced universal health insurance. It was a time when we introduced the Canada Pension Plan to augment the seniors' pensions. Unemployment insurance was enhanced, disability pensions were enhanced. So we were thinking that we could do a better job than we were in dealing with poverty. Because we recognize that the existing welfare system wasn't doing a very good job. Um, now, every time I put this slide up, um, social workers, people who work with the system, tend to look at it and say, well, you know, it's a, we have the same problems today. What happened in 1974? Well, it turned out the welfare system did a particularly bad job of dealing with the working poor and the self-employed. Well, it still does a pretty bad job of dealing with the working poor and the self-employed. We're a little better at the threshold effects. In 1974, um, if you earn some money, your benefits were reduced on a dollar for dollar basis. Most provinces do a little bit better than that now, but not a lot better in not all provinces. It was inequitable. People were treated very differently depending on which scheme they fell under and depending on, which, uh, depending on who they were. In 1974, it was a scheme that was very punitive towards people who were thought to be capable of working. So if you were a young man, for example, of working age, and you lived in a town like Dauphin, which I'll introduce in a minute, and you went to the local office and tried to claim what was then called mother's allowance. You have a pretty fair idea of what happened. Um, your welfare payment was very often a bus ticket to Winnipeg and the suggestion that you might want to look for a job elsewhere. So it punished people who were deemed employable. It punished them. And it tended to support single mothers um, with dependent children, but not at a very good um, rate. Now the idea of a guaranteed income was introduced because the idea was that it would let families get beyond just trying to make ends meet. People would be able to make some longer term decisions, investment decisions, and in particular investment decisions in things like the education for themselves or for their children. But the concern at the time was that if you give people money for nothing, why would anybody work? Everybody will quit their job. So all five of these North American experiments were introduced with the same idea in mind. We have to find out what happens to the labor market. We have to find out if people stop working, if you give them a guaranteed annual income. So income was introduced for exactly that reason. It was designed to find out what effects the guaranteed income would have on the labor market. And it was set up, as I explained at the beginning of this, what at the time was called the negative income tax, what we would call a refundable tax credit. No income at all, you received a flat amount that was slightly more generous than you might have gotten on mother's allowance. 
And for every dollar you earned on the labor market, your benefit would be reduced by 50 cents. There were two sites in Manitoba chosen for the experiment. There was a dispersed sample in Winnipeg. Now, a dispersed sample means that researchers go into town and they choose a small proportion of the total population. And they randomize people. Half of them would go into the test group, half of them would go into the control group. If you were in the test group, you got a guaranteed income. If you were in the control group, you didn't get anything. Um, you may do with whatever programs were in place. But what's unique about this experiment, and this is the only one of the five experiments in North America that had it, was the saturation site in the small town of Dauphin, Manitoba. Dauphin had about 10,000 people living in the town and another 2,500 in the rural municipality. It's an agriculturally dependent town. And what was unique about the saturation site was that the researchers went into town, um, publicized the experiment, and made a general promise to everybody in town. If your income falls below a certain amount of money, you're eligible for the program. Come down and sign up. So everybody in town was eligible to participate. The only families that actually received the money were families whose income fell below um, the specified threshold. So what happened to the labor market? Well, it turned out that the Canadian results were very similar to the American results. Um, there was virtually no effect at all on people who were called primary earners. A primary earner is a grown-up person with a real full-time job. And that's not surprising. I mean, most people with real jobs don't quit their jobs because they'd rather live on two-thirds of the poverty line. Um, so people who had real jobs continue to work. But there were two groups in the population that did reduce the amount they worked rather significantly. Um, married women. Now, married women are kind of interesting in this population because they effectively use the guaranteed income to buy themselves longer maternity <coughs> leaves. If you think back to the 1970s, mat leave entitlement was about four weeks or six weeks. Okay? And so what these mothers did was to anticipate the changes we've made in social policy subsequently. They said four or six weeks is not enough time to spend at home with my newborn. I'm going to take this money I've received from income, this guaranteed annual income, and I'm going to buy myself more months at home. And that's what they did. But the uh, second group is equally interesting. And here the language is tremendously important. Um, and this is the language of the time. If you're not a supporter of income, what you say is that young, unattached males reduce the number of hours they work really significantly. And I don't know what picture that paints in your mind, but when I hear that young, unattached males are running away from their job responsibilities, you start wondering what they're doing um, instead. And you start thinking about um, irresponsibility. You know, I, what are these young men doing? Are they playing video games? They're off uh, doing other things. But in fact, the language I've used here is the language, and you'll see why this is relevant in a minute. We're talking about adolescent children here. And adolescent boys, in particular, um, reduce the number of hours they worked. And they reduced the number of hours they worked in a really interesting way. They took their first full-time job at a later age. Okay. So instead of leaving a school at 16 and working full-time in manufacturing or agriculture, because those are the two jobs that are available to a 16-year-old boy, they stayed in the school and finished grade 11 or finished grade 12. And so before I go on, think about the differences in the life chances between that kid who finished grade 12 in 1974, 1975, and 1976, and the kid who didn't. And think about not only the life chances for that young man, but about the life chances of his children and his entire family. Because the one thing we know for certain is that since 1974, manufacturing and agriculture have not expanded as industries in this country. Anybody dependent on those particular areas has um, paid, a, paid a large price in terms of um, outcomes. <coughs> health and social effects? Well, I'm interested in the health and social effects. I wasn't particularly interested in the labor market effects, but it turned out that um, health and social effects were never a primary part of this experiment. Um, the research funding for the analysis started to run out midway through the experiment. Now, why would that happen? Well, I want you to think back to 1974 for a minute. What do we know about the decade of the 70s? This was a period when inflation reached about 10%. Right? Interest rates were hitting 18, 19, 20%. People were losing their homes. Unemployment was much larger than anybody expected it to be. When these people 
introduced an income, when the researchers introduced an income, they negotiated with the two levels of government for funding for the experiment in nominal dollars, right? And they negotiated $17 million for a five-year project. Then inflation hit 10%. And it turned out that the amount of money that had to go to the families was tied to the cost of living. So the amount of money paid out to the families was going up by 10% a year because of inflation. The funding was flat. Um, how do you run an experiment? You hire lots of people. You hire statisticians. You hire interviewers. Well, their wages are all going up 10% a year because if their wages don't go up, they won't work for you anymore. So the costs of the experiment are going up by 10% a year and the funding's staying flat. The researchers went back to the government, which by this time had fallen and been replaced by the progressive conservative government, and said, we need more money. And they said, no, there's no more money for this. Um, you're going to have to figure out how to do with the funding you have. Um, this project was run by economists. And so the economists decided to cut the peripheral projects, the less important projects. Well, it turned out that they thought the economics projects were the most interesting and most important <laughs> ones. So the labor market project stayed in place, and all the sociology and anthropology experiments were cut. Um, they continued to collect data. The data was collected by questionnaire, but no database was constructed for social analysis, and no significant analysis was done. And then the project ended in 1979, and the data languished. And about well, five or six years ago, I started to wonder what happened in Dauphin. Could they go back and find out what happened to the people who lived there? Was, what happened to their health? What happened to their quality of life? And in particular, were there any effects we could find that went beyond the labor market? Did anything happen beyond um, what, we, what we already know? And we focused on the saturation site. And we focused on Dauphin in particular because it turns out it matters whether uh, whether a social program is offered to everybody in a community or whether it's just offered to a few individuals. And I've, I've got this little example that's <coughs> going to turn out to be important in a minute. So just think about it. If you're a 17 year old boy and you're trying to decide whether to go back to school to finish grade 12, what matters to you and to your family? Well, one thing that's going to matter to you and to your family is how much money your family is going to have to support you for the next year. If you're living in a low-income family, and we heard from a number of people living in the families, that they will, the young men in particular in low-income families were under a significant amount of family pressure to become self-supporting as quickly as they could. Um, when income came along, the family had more money available. So the amount of money available, including the amount of money available through income, is going to be important for the family. But for the 17-year-old in particular, something else is going to be equally important, and that's whether or not his friends are going back to school for grade 12. And so it matters whether his friends are part of the experiment. Right? If his friends' families are in the experiment, they're more likely to go back, he's more likely to go back. And it kind of reinforces the changes that are taking place anyway. So I went looking for the data, and it took me a little while to find it. <laughs> And I finally tracked it down. It took me a while to find it because it uh, changed hands several times when the project ended. The researchers were told to archive the data for future analysis. And they sort of locked the doors on the office on Portage Avenue. The federal government would, started to get tired of paying for the rent on this office space and told them to do something with the data. They tried to make the province take it. The province said they had no room for it. Um, anyway. It uh, changed hands several times, and um, I finally tracked it down in a warehouse in Winnipeg under the control of the National Archives of Canada. But what I found was 1,800 boxes of data, and I'm putting air quotes around data. 1,800 boxes, no database, right? So we had paper copies of administrative records, there were paper copies of um, survey forms that people had filled out, there were blank questionnaires, and anthropologists and sociologists were hired to live with the families in Dauphin, and so they took notes on the way the community operated. A little bit of that was there. There were interviews with subjects of all kinds of topics. There was no organization, no database, no analysis of the Dauphin sample. And I thought, well, you know, my life's finite. There's, there's only so much I can do with these 1,800 cardboard boxes. <laughs> Not a lot of stats. But I thought, well, you know, Dauphin's not that big a town. There are only 10,000 people who live here. It's a small town. I can track people down pretty easily. 
And so I went to my research ethics board and I said, I'm going to go interview people who participated in this experiment. I'm going to get them to tell me what happened, what effect it had on their lives. And the research ethics board said, right, show us the waivers the family signed in 1974 that would allow you to recontact them. Turned out that we didn't do that in 1974. People did um, these kinds of research projects in the 1970s. This was just not part of the way it was done. So the university wouldn't allow me to contact people. They said I had to respect their privacy. So the two obvious ways of getting at the data were closed to me. The question was, is there any way to do this project I had in mind? Well, I had an idea of what I was going to do, um, but it was going to cost. And so the first thing I did was to call up a friend of mine who worked for the Department of Education in the province. And he spent three or four days filling out spreadsheets for me, giving me enrollment data on every single high school in the province of Manitoba. And I divided those high schools into three categories. On the far left, that sort of light blue or violet color, that represents Dauphin. The purple represents Winnipeg. Winnipeg's the only urban center in Manitoba. And the yellow represents the rest of Manitoba. And I made up this statistic. This is grade 12 enrollment as a percentage of the previous year's grade 11 enrollment. So what does that mean? Nothing happens to the underlying population, and everybody in grade 11 goes, goes into grade 12. That bar is going to reach 100%. The bigger your dropout rate between grade 11 and grade 12, the more that bar is going to fall below 100%. Right? Most people in grade 11 are old enough to legally leave school. And up until 1974, when the money started to flow, what you see is pretty much what you'd expect to see. There's no difference between Dauphin and the rest of rural Manitoba. City kids are more likely to finish high school than country kids. <coughs> no surprises there. That's true for 1971, 72, 73. Well, 74 is starting to look interesting. Look over here at 1975, when the Dauphin bar goes above the Winnipeg bar. Dauphin kids are more likely to finish high school than kids living in Winnipeg. 1976, the bar goes above 100%. Kids who'd already left school to go to work were coming back to finish grade 12. 1977, money's still flowing. We're at 100% in Dauphin, well above Winnipeg and the rest of Manitoba. 1978, we're at 100% in Dauphin. Project ends. Money stops flowing in 1978. 1979, right back where we started from. Dauphin kids are less likely to go to grade 12 than the Winnipeg kids. You have to ignore that last set of bars over there. They built a couple of high schools just outside of Winnipeg and screwed up my data. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, this is pretty cool, right? You've got this nice little bubble that's exactly coincident with, um, with the money flow of your income. Kids are more likely to finish high school. It's a pretty good finding. Well, I use that finding, and I think this is why Hugh Siegel called me entrepreneurial, because I put it into a grant application to CIHR and said, see, I've got these really good results. If you'd only give me some funding, I'll find better ones. And they did. And so I had this second database, and I just want to tell you a little bit about how this database is organized. Um, remember I said that the 1970s were a period when we were, um, when we were introducing a lot of new social programs, including Medicare. Well, the really nice thing about universal health insurance is that there's a whole lot of data collected, incidentally. If doctors want to get paid, it turns out they have to bill. And if they bill, it ends up in a database somewhere. And if hospitals are going to be funded, well, we have to know what's going on in the hospitals. And so we've got lots and lots of information. And in Manitoba, this is all organized in a really interesting way. If you've lived, and I should tell you that this database is all anonymized, it's all under the control of the provincial government, and there are significant restrictions on accessing it, so people's privacy is respected. But if you've lived in Winnipeg, if you've lived in Manitoba, any time between 1971 and the present, I've got you here in this population-based health registry. I've got you identified by your nine-digit health number, personal health number, and your six-digit family health number. That's very cool, right? I know where you lived every six months. <laughs> I, I don't know exactly where you live, but I know your six-digit postal code. And if I know your six-digit postal code, I can tie you into the census and find out a lot more about you. If you've been in the hospital, I know what hospital you were in, I know how long you were there, I know what they did to you there. Um, I know if you were transferred to other hospitals, if you went to the doctor, 
over here somewhere. Medical services. If you went to the doctor, I know what you went to the doctor for. I know if there were prescriptions filed. Um, but in statistics, if you died, I know why. Um, at least I sort of know why. If you had babies, I know about that. So I've got a lot of information there. Now this database has gotten a lot richer since uh, the early 1970s. And subsequently we've tied in things like um, children's aid, child and family services, we've got social assistance, so I know if a family's receiving income assistance. I know how kids are doing at school, on standardized tests, um, when they graduated, where they went to school, and so on. But all I had in the 1970s was hospital <coughs> data, the registry, vital statistics, and physicians. So you use what you can use, what you've got, right? Um, now, there's a real challenge here. A lot of things happened in the 1970s, and I want to make sure I can talk about causation. I want to make sure that the things I'm attributing to income were actually caused by income and not something else that was happening at the same time. So what do we do? Um, I set up a quasi-experimental design with a matched comparison group. Sounds sophisticated, but what did I really do? This is Winnipeg down here. Like I said, it's the only urban center in the province. There were about 450,000 people living in Winnipeg at the time. <coughs> Dauphin's up here, about 10,000 people living in it. The whole province has maybe 750,000 people living in it in the 1970s. I took that database, that health database, and I want to find controls. So if I have a 20-year-old woman living in Dauphin, I tried to find three other 20-year-old women living in similar kinds of places that I could use in order to uh, compare her results to. So I took out everybody living in the North, because the North is culturally and socially different from the South. It's also a place where there's a lot of difficulty accessing healthcare sometimes. I took out everybody living in Winnipeg. Now, I took out people living in Winnipeg because a small prairie town in 1974 is going to be a whole lot different from an urban center in 1974. And I took out everybody in the South living on a reserve. And I took people on reserves out because if you live on a reserve, your primary health care is the responsibility of the federal government. So you show up in my provincial database in a different way. And once I took all those people out, what I had left were people living in a whole lot of places, an awful lot like Dauphin, rural towns and rural areas. And then I matched. I used a propensity score matching, and I matched on a number of individual, family, and community characteristics. So I tried to find as good matches as I could from that database. I tried to find four matches for every subject. Um, in the event, I ended up with three. Um, I got three really good matches for everybody living there. Um, one of the limitations when you do that kind of matching is that you can only match on what's in your database. And I wanted to make sure that there were no unobservable differences between my subjects and my controls. So I went back to the long-form census, and I pulled out every variable I could find in the long-term census for 1971 to see if there were any differences between my subjects and my controls, and I found exactly two. The first one threw me for a bit of a loop. Um, I'm a city girl, right? <laughs> Turned out they're not more likely to be farmers in Dauphin, but if they are farmers, they're more likely to be growing canola. <laughs> um, does that matter? Um, I couldn't think of any good reason why it mattered whether you were growing canola or barley. But I thought, yeah, maybe other people know things that I don't. So I went to the Department of Agriculture at my university and said, okay, is there any reason the health of people growing canola would be different from the health of people growing barley? They tried their best. They came up with all kinds of really um, creative answers, but none of them were very <laughs> convincing. So that's a difference. They were growing canola there, but I don't think it matters. The second difference is ethnicity. It turns out that Dauphin is more Ukrainian than the controls. About a third of the people living in Dauphin almost claim to be of Ukrainian heritage. Now, does that matter? Well, Dauphin was settled by Ukrainians sometime between 1910 and 1920, so by the time you get to 1971, you're talking about second and third generation Ukrainians. I don't think it matters, but I mention that because maybe it does. Maybe there are lingering effects. It might be a limitation. Anyway, so I got all that. What do we find? Blue line represents Dauphin. These are hospitalization rates. The red line represents my controls, and if you look between 1974 and 1978, you'll see those two lines coming together. And in fact, what happens is that hospitalization rates fell by about 8.5% um, over the period of the experiment. Oops. 
Um, then I wanted to look, to look at the codes to find out, to see if I could tell why hospitalization rates were falling. And there were two categories of hospitalization that were primarily responsible. The first were accidents and injuries. Now, accidents and injuries is a big, big category that, that has all kinds of things in it. But, you know, what sorts of things show up under accidents and injuries? Here you're going to be picking up things like industrial accidents and farm accidents, um, car accidents, many of which are alcohol fueled, um, family violence, all kinds of violence, all kinds of things will show up here. And again, you see exactly the same result. The thick line represents Dauphin. During the period of the experiment, those two lines come together. By 1978, there's no significant difference between Dauphin and the control group. So we get a reduction in um, hospitalization rates due to accidents and injuries. And we also get a reduction in hospitalization rates due to mental health diagnoses. Okay. And again, this, uh, this is a very significant reduction in Dauphin hospitalizations for mental health relative to the comparison group. I also looked at physician contacts. Were people visiting <coughs> doctors more or less often? It turned out that there was a slight decline among Dauphin residents visiting family doctors. And when I tried to find out why, the only thing that showed up as significant were mental health diagnoses. So they were visiting doctors less often with mental health complaints than they had been before, and then the controls were there. Now, were there other effects? Um, when, when you look at anti-poverty research, one of the things that you always look at are birth outcomes. And the reason you look at birth outcomes is because low birth weight babies, early births, um, tend to be associated with health problems that persist throughout childhood and that sometimes affect a child's education and a long-term results. Um, birth outcomes tend to be associated with poverty for really for two reasons. First is the lack of prenatal care um, among poor mothers relative to others. And second is poor diet during pregnancy. I took the data I had and I spun it as many ways as I could and I couldn't find an effect. So that was a little bit disappointing that I didn't. I think the reason I didn't is because it's small numbers of the sample. Now, I had 10,000 people living in Doff and another 30,000 controls. Sounds like 40,000 is a big number. But it turns out that 40,000 people don't actually produce that many babies in a four-year period. And most babies are healthy anyway, and so bad outcomes are fairly rare. So they didn't show up. That was a disappointment. We also looked at two other things, and this we did sort of for fun. I told you that there were um, four experiments in the US, and they became very politicized during the period. Um, some senators um, were arguing that, um, remember those young men who weren't working? Well, they were worried about the young women too. And they were worried that the young women were having babies in order to drive up their entitlement under the income program. So if you introduce a guaranteed annual income, the argument goes, people will just have more babies and increase their entitlement. And uh, the second was the divorce rate. When the first data first started coming in in the US, it looked like the divorce rate was increasing in families that got a guaranteed annual income. And I think a lot of us can think of situations where a family probably ought to divorce but doesn't because one, one spouse worries about feeding kids, for example. But that wasn't the nature of the argument. The argument went something like this. If you give these women money, some of them are going to figure out that they can live just fine without their husbands. And that's not a good thing. That's an attack on the American family. And so this became very political. And as crazy as it sounds, this actually was debated in the Senate. One of the senators threatened to close down um, the U.S. projects and have all the families charged with welfare fraud um, for participating. So the researchers camped out in the office to protect the records. It, it, it became a real mess in the U.S. So I thought, well, I've got the data. Let me look and see if the Canadian family was under attack. Um, this is a picture. This picture is here just as a reminder that a lot of other things have been in divorce rates and a lot of things were happening in the 1970s. This is the Ukrainian Catholic Church in Dauphin. So there's a lot of confounders. Um, I looked at birth rates. If anything, the birth rate in Dauphin fell relative to the control group. They had, people tended to have their first birth at a later age and they had fewer children over a lifetime. I also looked at divorce rates. 
And you'll be happy to know that the Canadian family was not, um, was not destroyed by the introduction of the income. Okay, what do I conclude from all of this? Um, I think kids may have been most affected by this experiment. I say this because we've already seen that they tended to stay in high school a little bit longer. Um, I heard about the boys staying in high school a little bit longer because they didn't have to become self-supporting. But the reality is that the boys weren't leaving school, their girlfriends weren't leaving school to marry them, and they had three babies by the time they were 21 either. So the kids were staying in high school longer, they had their first child later, and they had fewer children over a lifetime. And all of those things are associated with better outcomes, better health outcomes for the kids, better outcomes for the family. The one thing that's missing um, from my story so far is uh, how the families thought that income affected them. Now, how did I find that out since I wasn't allowed to talk to them? Um, I, read, I read the files. I read the family files. We also interviewed all kinds of people. Um, we were told we weren't, allowed to, we weren't allowed to contact people and interview them. But nobody told us we couldn't ask people to contact us. And so I was interviewed on the radio several times, and um, my graduate student wrote articles for the local newspaper. And every time we did something, we invited people to call us up. If you want to talk to us about this really neat project we have underway, call us up. We'd be happy to talk to you. Um, and we talked to all kinds of people. I mean, one of the dangers of saying something like that on the radio is that all <laughs> kinds of people call you. <laughs> and so we talked to a lot of people who had nothing at all to do with the experiment. But we also talked to lots of people who were subjects, lots of people who did participate in the experiment. And thirdly, press reports. What I'm going to show you now, this is my best unpaid research assistant. When I first started doing this project, I um, presented it to my department. Somebody thought it was an interesting story, so they called the Winnipeg Free Press. And I got a call from a reporter. And the reporter said, I hear you've got this really interesting project. Tell me about it. I said, yeah, I've got this way cool project. I use propensity score matching. I had a negative binomial distribution. <laughs> she said, yeah. She said, no, that's really boring. I want to talk to the people. Put me in touch with them. I'm not allowed to. The ethics board won't let me introduce you to anybody. She said, ethics. <laughs> so, I'm a reporter. I don't have to worry about ethics. <laughs> and so she went to Dauphin. And she camped out at the seniors' residence, and she started buying coffee for people <laughs> and talking to them. And she said, okay, who wants a picture of the Winnipeg Free Press? And she said, I know people down the hallway. This is Amy Richardson. Now, Amy Richardson just died this April. She's, she's an incredible lady. Um, but she was um, a mother of six children, and she had a disabled husband um, during the experiment. And in fact, her husband died during the experiment. So she became a young widow with six kids. And um, she ran the Dauphin Beauty Parlor out of her home. She was cutting people's hair in her kitchen. And she says she used the extra money, the money that income gave her for luxuries like um, school books. Mm -hmm. um, it was to bring her, and this is really, I've got all of these quotations from people. The one thing I'll notice from all of these quotations is that people talk about the lack of stigma, mm -hmm. right? The lack of stigma. She says it was to bring your income up to where it should be. It was enough to add some cream to the coffee. Everybody was the same, so there was no shame. Hugh and Doreen Henderson, these people are very typical of the families in my, in my study. Um, they lived just outside of Dauphin on an acreage. They kept chickens in the backyard, had a huge garden. He was a school janitor at a time when that was a low paid season of job. And she stayed home with the two kids. Um, Hugh says, if a kid wants an education and he's willing to pay for it, I think the government should help. If we'd have had more money, I'd have loved to pay for university for my kids. As it was, he paid for high school. And he was quite proud of having his kids finish high school, which wouldn't have been uh, taken for granted. Doreen says, give them enough money to raise their kids. People work hard and it's still not enough. This isn't welfare. This is making sure kids have enough to eat. They should have kept it. Made a real difference. And I love this guy, Rick Sablitney, and I love this guy because he's exactly the sort of person you'd think would not be a supporter of income. He was a chartered accountant, okay? So by any definition, his income is probably going to be higher, too high, at any point in his life to collect support from a program like income. But in fact, he was a great supporter. He says, we always felt the problem with the welfare system is it was punitive. If you made money, they took it away from you. <laughs> 
It seemed to us that income was for people who were on that line. They weren't deadbeats. They needed a bit of a boost. I'd be in favor of it now. Helping someone have a decent living wage is what to argue with. I usually give him the last word, but I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just put a little plug in here. And I think I want to leave you with a question. Um, is this a time <coughs> when we want to introduce, when we want to update Delta? Do we want to introduce another experiment <coughs> to find out whether a guaranteed annual income is worth the cost? Is this something that would improve people's lives? Thank you. Thank you.